Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, talking all things movement, whole food nutrition and environmental wellness with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Hello everybody and welcome to episode number two for the year. My name is Ben Adelberg coming to you from Auckland and from a sweltering hot booner, Emma Strutt. Hey Emma, how are you doing? <laughs> G'day, g'day. I'm going pretty well. A bit warm, but yeah, not too bad, Ben. How are you? No, I'm good, thanks. I'm sorry I made you switch the fan off. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's get going. So first, a few things. First, um, our first newsletter of the year has gone out. Now, if you have not received it, you have not subscribed. So make sure you subscribe um, and it gives you... A few other little bits of information that you won't hear on these podcasts and it might send you in other directions like our website. So make sure you subscribe and share it. Share it with people. Now, if you've been on our website, you will also have noticed two new little icons at the top in addition to our Instagram and Facebook links. Um, The first is our YouTube channel. So we've just created this because um, I've been doing a few rambles on my long runs But more importantly, we actually want to create uh, content relating to some of the conversations we've been having through the year, as well as some of the actions as well that we are taking. So that'll be a place where we're going to post a lot of our videos. The other one is you can now buy us a coffee from anywhere in the world. That's right. So we don't mean a literal coffee, although that's nice too if you're local to us. Um, So as you guys know, this is a bit of a passion project for us. It's completely self-funded. Now, the content will always be free because we believe this is a really important, um, you know, message that we're sharing. But if you value our work and you'd like to help us, you know, fund a couple more projects and resources that we have in the works, um, please do have a look at that and consider buying us a coffee. Exactly. And our last bit of admin, uh, just under two weeks to go. Tarawera, 165 kilometers. Yep, big sigh. Um, So as you know, I've been using that as a platform to raise for the uh, Native Forest Restoration Trust. And part of that has been creating content, raising awareness of the environment, which I call our playground. A lot of you have donated. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. You still have time. Please, please, please give a little and uh, it'll go a long way. Now, World Wetlands Day. It is on the 2nd of February. And if you're listening to this podcast today, which is as in the first day it's been released, it is tomorrow. So we thought it would be highly appropriate to have a guest from both Australia and New Zealand to talk about wetlands. Our second guest will talk about a very specific area within Queensland, but on today's show, we are actually going to learn a whole lot about wetlands in general. That's right. So today we're joined by Melanie Dixon. Melanie has a passion for wetlands. She works as a principal ecologist, providing wetland management advice to private landowners, community groups and local government. Melanie is also a trustee and acts as deputy chair for New Zealand's National Wetlands Trust. So, Melanie, thank you so much for joining us today. I've seen you described as a swamp fanatic before, so I'm very (laughs) much looking forward to this conversation, just in time for World Wetlands Day. Kia ora, and thank you so much for having me on and uh, choosing the topic for and helping highlight World Wetlands Day. Awesome. Now, um, Melanie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about, uh, you are a principal ecologist. Um, Mm. And uh, so tell us a little bit about your background and your evolving passion for the environment. It would have started when I was a kid, as it does for most people. I have a a suburban West Auckland upbringing uh, here in Te Atatū and uh, living quite close to the mangroves. So the mangroves were, I guess, one of the first natural areas that I was aware of. I also was taken... um, taken to, for walks in the Waitakere Ranges and we spent a lot of time over summer going camping in sort of more wild remote places so and I climbed uh, I loved climbing trees so I wasn't I did like the I did like the outdoors and at school I quite enjoyed science so I did um, so I took that on to university and it was at university when I was doing lots of different things science and geology and bits and maths and things and then when I did ecology I was like oh this is my thing 
this is this is what this is what I enjoy. This is what I this is what I want to work in. So I did uh, quite a lot of sort of general ecology, and then um, then fell into wetlands really because there there weren't a lot of people working there at the time, and they needed people to do that. And uh, my first job was at Waitakere City Council. I got dragged out to. Um, there's a big wetland in West Auckland. Uh, people either call it Bethel Swamp or Waitakere Wetland, dra- out there, and then just sort of um, got into got into that side. So, yeah. Gosh, a lot of puns there. You got you fell into it. You got dragged through it. <laughs> um, obviously, setting the scene for wetlands. Um, so. Tell us more. So, you know, for us, um, we've, the, the episodes up to now, we've spoken mm. a lot about terrestrial, you know, related environmental space in terms yes, yeah. of trees and soils and so on. We've yeah. we've had guests talk about oceans and, and so on, yes. but wetlands and, um, you know, kind of sits in the middle, you know, it's, it's, it's there's stuff growing in there, there's plants, but it's wet. Um, so yeah. tell us, let's start from the very beginning, basic 101 lesson, what are wetlands? Thank you. Yeah, it'd be great to cover that because I think a lot of people who are interested in environmental areas, you start hearing about wetlands. You know, wetlands are important, um, but people aren't really entirely sure exactly what they are or they they know of some of them but not all of them because they're actually, they're actually incredibly diverse, particularly in New Zealand. But you're right, they are halfway between the the – terrestrial and aquatic so they they have they have the three elements obviously first of all they have the water without water they're not they're not wetlands and you the 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 water can come from it can come from rainfall it can come from say streams or overland flow and it can come from groundwater and sort of the amounts of water in a wetland makes for the different types of wetlands you, that, that we have. So all those terms that you hear like swamp, bog, uh, marsh, fen, they're, they're all different wetland words and they all relate to where the water comes from and sort of the amounts. So you've got the water and the water makes really crucial changes to the soils mostly because it's reducing the it's reducing the amount of oxygen in the soils partly depending whether the whether the water is 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 above the soil or it drops below occasionally it's making these is making these changes to the soil and then that changes the plants the plants that can the plants that can grow in the wetlands have to be specially adapted to these particular soils now they have to be able to um, bring oxygen oxygen down to their roots so that's why you'll see quite a lot of them are that sort of reed structure sort of tall and thin and within their structure they can bring a lot of they can bring a lot of oxygen down to the down to their uh, roots and they can sort of float or if you think about the mangroves or manawa that grow in our coastal areas they've got those oxygen roots those pneumatophores they all have to have particular adaptations to sort of the wetland environment so that's those three things that sort of um the the water the soils and the plants that sort of that pull together that that concept of 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 um of a wetland um and so there's a real super diversity there across because you think they can occur in mountain areas you can have your mountain tarts and they can occur right on our coasts where we can have our mangroves and our sea grasses and then and we can have we can have wetlands that are dominated by uh, forest, and I know one of your guests has talked a little bit about the kahikatea trees that once grew in great forests over the over the country. Uh, probably one of the ones people will be more familiar with are the big um, flax and cabbage tree swamps, Tukoka and Harakeki swamps that used to be across a lot of the, the country as well. So it's actually a really it's actually a really broad range of of things that come under wetlands and that that's what makes them so fascinating as much as anything else yeah now wetlands they're often undervalued in my opinion anyway they aren't you know extremely beautiful in that traditional sense but they're not just swampy breeding grounds for mosquitoes are they we shouldn't no be no they're not and, and houses on them like in gold coast or crocodiles if you're in australia yeah, <laughs> yeah. That might that might make it a little more challenging to do your field work in in wetlands, but yeah, there's there's 
And you might be lucky to be eaten by a native leech if you're in New Zealand. That'd be about as <laughs> about as far as going. No, and and, ki- and kiwis don't love them as much as they uh, love our beaches or our forests. Or, or but I, th- you know, I th- I, th- I think that's um, I think that's uh, turning around. I think people are beginning to see. I, I mean, I obviously they're my passion, so I see I see a lot of a lot of beauty in them. Um, a lot of um, different colours and, and textures to the to the plants that were there, but I think you know that that seeing them as as, as uh, nasty places for mosquitoes and things that comes from the the, the European tradition that's come mm-hmm. over with that's come over with colonisation. It's it's certainly not the way that uh, Tangata Whenua viewed the wetlands here. They were they were um, they were their food baskets. That's where they were getting their tuna. Um, a whole of their resources for 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 building for fiber um, special um, there were special muds that we use for dyes so um, the the idea of the the idea of them being wastelands and places that needed to be changed that that came across from uh, a European tradition which um, and you can see it in our in our language still we you know we, Donald Trump came in and talked about draining the swamp and, you know, you're using swamp as an idea of corruption and, and we will talk about worker being bogged down with work and things. So yeah, the, the, it is part of a, like a, a cultural hangover that there's problems there. Sorry. So the, you wanted me to say about what the importance were of Absolutely. these areas. Were. Yeah. Yeah. Finally getting to that. So, uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that they're usually described of as being the being kidneys. They're like the they're the planet's kidneys because they they're very very good at filtering the water that that comes through them. They slow it down, and the the plants are usually quite crucial to this. It's all these uh, sort of complicated biochemical processes, sometimes mediated by the bacteria that live there, but they can break down extra nitrates. And we know that nitrates are a problem. They can absorb a lot of heavy metals. They can just, a lot of the, a, a lot of pollution is just sediment and sediment will drop out in these wetland areas. So the water that is coming out of the uh, the other end of wetlands for the wetlands that they flow through is a lot better quality. And um, in some instances, and you'll see this in urban areas, you'll see that we try sometimes to actually build wetlands to do this, to to clean up uh, water in urban areas. But it's um, it's it's a little, it's more difficult to build than if you have a have a natural one. I'm not sure we ever get them quite as good as 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 um, nature manages, but we can certainly replicate some of the uh, water quality treatment features. So. Uh, there's, there's that side, and and I think increasingly recognised and increasingly important is wetlands' role in the carbon cycle and in um, in storing carbon and carbon sequestration. So, uh, the worldwide wetlands cover about a third. Wet, wetlands contain more carbon than our forests. And that's because they put the carbon down into the soil, building up uh, peat, which is that, which is a, which is a wetland soil. So they're they're incredibly they're incredibly important for for uh, for carbon. Of course, if you drain it, that carbon is then lost back to their atmosphere. But if they're healthy, they'll be taking carbon down all the time. So that's your fresh that's what's happening with your freshwater wetlands. There's also something which we're increasingly calling blue carbon, which is the carbon that um, your coastal wetlands like your seagrass and your mangroves, uh, they're they're um, they're thought to be something like between 30 and 50 times better at storing carbon than um, than even tropical forests. So the so the, the coastal wetlands are also incredibly important for for um, for carbon. But also the other thing that they're really important for is uh, for reducing some of the impacts of of um, a warming world, which is increased uh, storms and storm surges and um, if you have a look online, you can find some of the videos. But when waves hit mangrove forest, they the, the 
the mangroves can dissipate some of that energy. So it's they're really more effective and obviously a lot cheaper than seawalls to have a lot of mangroves that are uh, protecting, which are protecting your, um, which are protecting the land. Um, there's an instance, and in, I think it was Hurricane Laura in August last year, that was meant to cause in the states that was meant to cause huge storm surges of about six meters. Uh, it just lucky um, enough, it ran into a wetland, mm -hmm. uh, ran into a reasonably intact area of coastal wetland, and that significantly reduced the the surge. It was meant to go 70, 65 kilometres inland, but it hit this wetland, which absorbed most of the absorbed most of this energy. So, what's that? That's carbon. Um, kidneys cleaning, hazard reduction. Oh, biodiversity, that's, of course, an, another great one. And, and certainly a lot of people who get into wetlands get into it from appreciating bird life because they're, they're incredibly important for that, um, not just bird life, but they do have particularly high numbers of, of birds, and that's, um, that's, uh, that's, an, that's another important reason for, yeah, that's another one of their important values. Listening to um, to you talk about um, you know the the what makes a wetland, mm -hmm. as someone that spends an incredible amount of time outdoors and mountains and bushland forests etc around yeah. New Zealand, it starts to make me think that I've actually come across more wetlands than I realise. You know, because yes. like you say, you know, we think it's just a swamp or it's just a you know mangroves. Yes, we know those are wetlands, but. Yeah. Uh, there's there seems to be a lot more uh, a bigger range or bigger variety of of wetlands. Are you, are you able to sort of give us an example or kind of are they categories or are they different types or what distinguishes one type of wetland from another? But there seems to be quite a few different types, aren't there? Yeah, there there, there are, and I think probably our most overlooked ones, and you know they're a challenge to map to and sort of get a handle on monitoring them and their numbers are ones that are uh, dominated by either forest trees or, or by scrub. And so um, in New Zealand, a lot of our wetlands can actually be dominated by manuka. There are some in Australia, um, leptospermum, I don't I imagine they probably grow in wetlands there as well. They're such a, they're such an adaptable plant that they can actually that, that they can actually grow in uh, wetland areas, um, particularly sort of coastal coastal wetlands, and yeah, you could probably have gone through those without realizing those those areas those areas were wetlands, and it makes them a bit vulnerable too because they look like just what's usually called here scrub or regenerating forest, and may not realize it is as valuable as wetlands. So yeah, there's there's we got the the uh, basis of category, categorizing them goes back to the hydrology. So if we start with things that are only that only have rainfall as their only source, those are the bogs. So those you'll see more on hilltops or mountain tops, or you know they're sort of they're a little yeah, bit higher no, up. Yeah, no, but there's, there's some big some ones in the there's the Kapuatai Peak Dome, which is in the Waikato. But you can't because the thing so it is the the whole landscape is so flat and it doesn't have a lot of areas where you can sort of access and see it. But certainly, yes, there there are a lot up in the higher areas, and the reason for that is because it's colder. The you know the water's not evaporating as quickly, so it but it it it, it builds up. So yes, you get all the it, you yeah you do have those bogs and sort of the the uh, mountainous areas and sort of at the at the other end um, where you've got and you have high fertility because it's been fed by by rivers or streams as well as um, as well as groundwater you'll have the swamps so that's where you're that's probably the bits that you're most likely to see little bits remaining on farmland you sort of might see a few a few cabbage trees in a corner, or, so, or, or or something like that. Those are the swamps, and and flax is also an important component of those. And then you have marshes, which have a they have a lot of fluctuating. They have very high fluctuations in water in in water levels, and 
salt marshes are a kind of course the fluctuation there is with the tide so there are the um for the freshwater marshes the fluctuations with flooding when with a lot of our rivers now sort of sort of trained by the you know flood protection so they don't they don't go up and you know they don't fluctuate so much we we do we do see less of those but so those if you you know the coastal ones up and down the country even up in in the northern areas where you have the mangroves um and behind them you'll have like the salt marshes that, that you usually will have a have an area of salt much and those areas can be you can have quite big areas in our, in our estuaries and things like that um we i mean we also take we take quite a broad we meaning at the wetland trust we take a broad definition of wetland so we we pick up all of the we consider all the little lakes and things to fall in and lakes and estuaries to be included in those all those different in those definitions as well and i see ge- geothermal pools as well geothermal yes never thought those were wetlands yes I've, thank you for reminding me of those ones. Yes, there's not too many near where I live. So, yeah, I mean, they're a pretty neat kind of wetland. You can imagine they have some very specialised uh, kinds of plants that uh, grow in them. I don't like to get that close to them myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out with some botanists and it's been a bit scary. And they're like, oh, what's growing over here? I'm like, ah, boiling mud. And <laughs> yes, so, but yeah, geothermal wetlands are another another kind of uh, wetland, possibly a little bit less at risk in some regards, keep people out pretty well. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Um, Now, you mentioned just briefly before the impact of farming on Mm. wetlands. Now, a lot of New Zealand's wetlands have either been drained or filled. Mm. Um, What are some of the things that are affecting wetlands at the moment, apart from farming? Well, usually the... um what will be quoted for wetland loss in New Zealand is 90%. So any ecosystem that is that depleted will have a lot of issues because of the amount of loss there's been regardless. So, it, you know, even if you even setting aside farming, there would be issues now with just the fact that so many of the pieces are so small and so isolated. So uh, it's difficult for, for plants and animals to get between these small little fragmented areas. Most of the wetlands were actually cleared in sort of more of the pioneering days of of agriculture. There were actually in New Zealand subsidies for farmers to convert wetlands to pasture up to, um, I think it was 1987. Gosh. Yeah. So, you know, I've I've met farmers who, who like, well, you know, the government used to give us money to get rid of these areas. So it's within... it's so they were incentivized it, effectively. Yeah, to they do were incentivized. Yeah, there was money for there was money for land development. So it was, so those those disappeared. Uh, there was the fourth Labor government, and that was about that time. And then 1991 was the Resource Management Act, and that was uh, meant to be the end of uh, wetland loss. It hasn't it hasn't quite been worked worked out that way but for the remaining for the remaining wetlands some of those issues about um some of those issues about sedimentation and nutrients I've talked about how good wetlands are at uh cleaning up water but there's a limit to that like filters can get clogged it's that's they're like too you reach much a tipping sediment. point yeah, that's yeah, that's that's exactly it. So it's they they can do it, but not if it's too much, it'll start impacting their health, mm. uh, and the you you get a reduction and you get a change in the plant communities and a reduction in the in the in the in their biodiversity um, if 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 the if they are dealing with pollution, uh, particularly sediment and. Some of the there's so many we talked about there's so many different wetland types. Some are more vulnerable to to pollution than than others. But I think the I think the main issue is that the um, with farming is there's still pressure to clear some of these clear some of these areas. Uh, the other issue is we've got a lot of farming on areas which were they were wetland. Like if you look at the Hauraki Plains, a lot of the areas in the mm-hmm. Waikato, so they are peat soils, and these peat soils, when they're exposed to the air, that they're, they're not wet anymore, um, they're drained wetland, the 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 peat degrades. So six percent of our carbon emissions actually comes 
from in New Zealand actually comes from this peat degrading and, and breaking and breaking down. And so what that means is the is the surface is actually um, you know the the whole land shrinking. And then, then you've got to um, then the farmers and and um, the flood protection authorities have to look at well we have to do more drainage because the whole thing is like is 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 sinking further down and we're certainly seeing some um, issues in certainly in the Hauraki Plains with um, with some of that land is now below sea level so and then you have to like put pumps in to keep it to sort of keep it keep it dry so uh, we're actually really trying to look at whether um, some of these some of these areas could we could look at some alternative land uses that might inv- that would involve uh, re-wetting re-wetting the peat. It just seems so ironic because you know you talk about wetlands being the kidneys being the filters and, mm. and, and cleaning mm. waterways we know that um, farming in New Zealand, in particular, but anywhere in the world, is mm. is very um, is very harmful to our rivers. Over seventy percent of our rivers in New Zealand polluted. Over forty percent of our lakes. Um, so you would think there would be incentive to keep wetlands to help the impact of farming. Yeah. Is it a lack of protection of wetlands? Is it a lack of understanding? I mean, sure, one hundred and fifty years ago. No one really cared about the environment, mm-hmm. but now knowing, I mean, farmers having the pressure from and just knowing the, the damage that they're causing to the environment, why are they still clearing? Is the incentive still there from the government? No, the, no, the, the, the incentives aren't there. And you know, we've been, at the Wetland Trust, we've been thinking the same thing. What's what's going on? There's, there's meant to actually be, be rules in place now. Um, you know, we know we're still losing some of these wetlands and we know they're the solution. We know they're the solution for things like climate change and water quality. So we know we need more of them, not not less of them. First thing would be to the first thing would be to keep the ones we've got and then start looking at restoring mm. and, and restore restoring more of them. And uh, we're actually very lucky to get funding from the Eli uh, Environmental Trust. And uh, we've done some work looking at some case studies of where we've where we've lost wetlands, and um, I guess the, the the conclusion for that is there's that the rules are pretty good. You know, the the and since about ninety um, since two thousand and three, it's been pretty clear that uh, wetland wetland dra- drainage is um, is not allowed um, without a resource consent from the regional council the rules are there but the rules are not being publicized and they're not being in, and they're not and they're not being enforced mm. so there's a lot of this is just happening uh it, it it's happening but it's not being um it is not it's not approved if you if you not get my um get yeah. my meaning there um so we we've actually releasing we will be releasing this report tomorrow on uh, World Wetlands Day. It'll be up on our will be up on our website, uh, and people can can read that information for themselves. But I think the 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 main conclusion for that is it's a lack it's a lack of promotion and enforcement of of the rules. Uh, we did find a few sort of loopholes, like sometimes there's been the situation where the vegetation's not being protected, so people have cleared the vegetation, and then because the vegetation, then because the area can't meet a definition of a wetland without the vegetation, then you can drain it. Mm. So there, there have been a Blue few poles. Blue poles, yeah. But there, some new rules came in on um, last in, near the end of last year, and that they are strong rules, um, but we have. Um, uh, you know, our conclusion is is, is strong strong rules are not are not enough, and I, I think it it's um, partly I guess it's like you know, do people wear seat belts? Well, or use um, actually maybe a better example is using uh, cell phones in the car. You know, we know it's a we know it's illegal, but some people haven't really accepted that it's uh, that it's that's as important, so they don't necessarily sort of follow it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, wetlands are understood to be a very important component to 
managing environmental change and mm. yet it's one of those areas that's that's hugely hugely affected globally so you know and here we've got an example why it continues to be which is just it's just mind-boggling because it's it's mm. We've got so little left, ten percent. I mean, that's that's yeah. And know. when you say ten percent, that's ten percent as a national figure. We've got we've got uh, our eastern sort of regions, so sort of like say the Hawke's Bay, you'll be down to one or two percent, mm. or or Canterbury, you'll be down to one or two percent. Whereas the uh, the west coast of the South Island is probably sitting still at about thirty thirty percent. Well, that's because so it never stops raining there. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a, it's a, yeah it's a it's yeah. a lot it's a lot harder. But actually, in in your drier areas, uh, and this is one of the values of them as well, because they they're like big sponges that you know, and and that that helps with the with the flooding, but it also helps with maintaining groundwater levels because it will hold the they hold the water and they put the they they slowly release the water back into uh, uh, back into the groundwater. Right. So yeah. they're stopping. Yeah. So in in dry areas, they'll certainly, um, if you've got them, yeah, and, and incredibly important to hang on to them. Yeah. Now you mentioned the report that you're about to mm. release. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the National Wetland Trust and and what you guys get up to. Yeah. So we've been around now since um, since 1999. And um, we're um, an umbrella organisation for grassroots um, wetland enthusiasts and community groups and and uh, professionals and and others who who are interested in work in the areas of of um, wetlands. And uh, we have a we have a newsletter. We've got um, for our members. We have we do social media. We run a World Wetlands Day event. We had um, a great event yesterday in the Waikato, but we publicise all the the events uh, nationally on our on our website. And um, our aim is to increase the awareness and appreciation of wetlands. And our tagline is getting Kiwis into wetlands, and we mean that. Um, literally and figuratively we think the key to appreciating them is to actually spend some time in these spend some time in these areas and that's why we spend a bit of time trying to keep our um website up to date with the lots of the lots of the wetlands that that you can um visit uh, and whatever area you're in there'll be there'll be a few and um Accessible places to visit as well because a lot of our wetlands now have uh, boardwalks through them. So, um, and for a lot of people who may not be able to do a big backcountry walk, they'll be able to do um, or you know a massive trail run. They might be able to do a little local boardwalk through through a. Uh, uh, a wetland. So, another thing we do, um, which we've been a bit coveted, is that we do run a big um, symposium every two years, where we bring together um, wetland managers, community groups, iwi scientists, just, just to share what we're doing and the new science and sort of those sorts of things. Um, and we've got a. We would like to create a. Um, a national wetland centre. We have a place in Lake Rotopiko, which is near Ohopo in the uh, Waikato. And uh, we've got a predator-proof fence there and through a small peat lake, um, which we have, and we have lots of volunteers who, who work on that. In terms of the... Um, in terms of the idea of having National Wetland Centre, we're still waiting for a fairy godmother for that. But in the meantime, we're working on more things in terms of getting Kiwis into wetland. We just recently uh, got some funding and built a pontoon so people can actually get out and onto the onto the peat lake there. Amazing. Um, now, on your website, there's, uh, there's an incredible amount of information. I mean, you've just said you, you spent a considerable amount of effort keeping that up to date and and putting as much accessible information on there now under the resource tab there's there's lots of posters teaching resources and there's the wetland restoration guide massive guide 
uh, which unfortunately we can't put a copy of on our website because it's multiple. Each each chapter is in a, yes, is a different PDF yeah. uh, document. But uh, are, are you familiar with uh, you know enough to, to give us a few key outtakes from from that report or from that guide rather? The uh, Wetland Restoration Handbook. Yes, handbook. Yeah. That's okay. Right. I I have a I have a signed copy on my on my bookshelf. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was um, several people uh, who were involved in writing that are involved in the and have been involved in the Wetland Trust. They're either past or, or present trustees. Uh, and Bev Clarkson, she was one of the she was one of the um, leaders in putting that together. And she's a wetland scientist working at Manaki Whenua Land Care Research, and. Um, it's great that it's been made accessible. You don't, you know, you can get a, you could get a hard copy. It's out of print. You could get a hard copy at the library, or you could, you could download, you could download um, the, you could download the chapters. Um, they've got a link, as we say on our website, take you to, take you to where you can download all the chapters. It, it, it's, um, it's a real good intro into wetland restoration. I think there a lot of there's a lot of restoration in New Zealand of bush, and you tend to follow um, fence it off, get rid of the pests, get rid of the weeds, and that's you know that's the sort of the three pillars of of restoration. But when when you when you're dealing with a wetland, it's a, a there's a there's a few more things to think about. Uh, including looking at the hydrology, whether that needs to be restored. Do you need to do you need to block some drains? Do you um, do you need to uh, has water been diverted elsewhere? And do you need to bring it back? What's the nutrient levels in in the water? Is that going to be is that going to be a concern? You know, how do the water levels interact with the if, with the weeds or things? So it's a it's a, yeah it's a it's a neat step through all those things and also um, all, also bearing in mind if you need to deal with the council with any of these sorts of things because you might need you you might need particular permits for it. So yeah, that's um that's a that's the resource I'd recommend for uh, anybody who's in- interested in restoring wetlands, along with, of course, joining the National Wetland Trust and starting to get getting involved and coming along to some of our symposia and um, checking out some of the some of the resources we have. Now the, we've mentioned a couple of times World Wetlands Day on Feb the second. The theme this year is wetlands and water, and it's highlighting the role of wetlands um, and how they, you know, play a key integral role in keeping our water clean and keeping our ecosystem Mm. resilient um you know sustainable livelihoods and jobs as well the list is kind of endless there um for anyone that's listening today so the first or maybe tomorrow the second of feb um are we too late to celebrate with you what how are you celebrating world wetlands day this year yes a lot of the events have been held the weekend before because it's fallen this year on a it's fallen this year on a tuesday but Mm. there are i think possibly some events coming up the following weekend have a jump on our website have a look and see if there's uh any events in your area there's possibly like most of these are organized by um a lot of them organised by community groups, or sometimes by regional councils, or local councils, or or sometimes the Department of Conservation, and and usually on top of other stuff they're doing as part of their job as well. So uh, the, I think there's a, it feels like there's a few less this year, and I think that's a that's that's a COVID related thing. You know, you like wow, do you organise something and then find mm. it might get it might get shut down. But I would encourage anybody who uh, finds there isn't an event in their area uh, to to just find out more about their wetlands in their area and um, you know see if you see what you might be able to see if you if you look at it with uh, with fresh eyes. So that wetland restoration guide, a handbook. Sorry, I keep yeah. calling it a guide, but that handbook. Yeah, uh, is that something for? on a bigger scale so say i purchase a big plot of land and a farm or something or is that something i can actually apply to my own home in the back back garden that maybe has a stream running through or to what degree Mm. or if not what can you know if we start if we do care about the importance of wetland Mm -hmm. what can we then do on a small scale on a a small scale i was thinking about this is is like a urban dweller myself it's a, you may not be a, you may not have a wetland to restore but you can sort of bring some of those uh, wetland principles which is about about slowing water down filtering water um, 
and 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 cleaning it as 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 much as possible because if you if you look at our the at our um, cities the 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 way water has been treated uh, in I guess the the twentieth century is you get it to sea as quickly as you can mm. get it get it in pipes get it out to the streams if you haven't piped the stream already and and just get it out get it out to sea and that has caused that's caused uh, lots of problems with changing changing the flows for uh, rivers and urban areas because they you have so much concrete so it um and 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 impervious surfaces they call it so um one of the concepts that's coming up in in the wetland world is of sponge cities so it's like trying to um you trying to slow down, filter and absorb wetlands. So you may not be able to build a whole wetland on your your little section, but you might be able to put in a few wetland plants that are going to filter the water that comes off your driveway or something like that. Or you might you might be able to rather than piping your water straight to straight to a um, you know straight to the stormwater infrastructure, straight to the pipes. You might be able to have a tank that then lets it slowly seep out and go into the groundwater. So, you know, those are those are some of the things perhaps you can do as as um, as urban as urban dwellers will be will be thinking about. Um, so there's there's another concept called um, water water sensitive urban design, uh, and that's the you see some of the planting that you'll see around some urban areas now. Um, is actually uh, things like rain gardens, and they're trying to replicate what some of the things the wetlands are doing by uh, yeah filtering, filtering water and things. Um, there's examples in some of our biggest cities of these. Well, Melanie, I think this has been a brilliant way to kick off <laughs> the well. We're going to call it the month, wetland month. Oh, um, month, <laughs> rather than than go wetland, go wetland month. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, and, and um, for our listeners in Australia or anywhere else in the world, look online, do a little research and see mm. see what's happening in your community. You know, next week we've got a guest from, from Australia, so we're definitely going to learn about a very particular area. But, um, yeah, get involved. And, uh, man, we're really appreciative of, of you coming onto the show, teaching us about a whole you know, I was going to say a whole new world, but there's so little of it left, which is such a shame, but really, really brings a, a new level of appreciation for a component that is so important to the health mm-hmm. of our planet, mm-hmm. um, which subsequently is our own personal health. Mm. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of it left anywhere in the world. So it is something that we need to really treat, you know, as precious and and and, and try and reinstate where we can. So thank yeah. you so much again coming onto the show to share your your knowledge and that insight and uh inspire us to do a little bit more thank you Scott, i always think that we need wetlands more than they need us really we just need to wake up to that exactly yeah no thank you very much melanie thank you thank you thank you for listening to the lentil intervention podcast if you found this interesting make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends 